50 years ago, when the WWF was founded, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion, over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. But the impact of these extra millions of people has spread far beyond the space that they physically claimed. The spread of industrialization has changed the chemical consistency of the atmosphere. The oceans that cover most of the surface of the planet have been polluted and increasingly acidified. And the Earth is warming. We now realize that the disasters that continue increasingly to afflict the natural world have one element that connects them all. The unprecedented increase in the number of human beings on the planet. The population of the world is now growing by nearly 80 million a year. One and a half million a week. A quarter of a million a day. 10,000 an hour growing. In this country, it's projected to grow by 10 million in the next 22 years. All these people in this country and worldwide, rich or poor, need and deserve food, water, energy, and space. Will they be able to get it? I don't know. I hope so. You may have seen the government's foresight report on the future of food and palming. It shows how hard it is to feed the seven billion of us who are alive today. It lists the many obstacles that are already making this harder to achieve. Soil erosion, salinization, the depletion of aquifers, overgrazing, the speed of plant diseases as a result of globalization, the absurd growing of food crops to turn into biofuels to feed motor cars instead of people, and so on. So it underlines how desperately difficult it's going to be to feed a population that is projected to stabilize in the range of 8 to 10 billion people by the year 2050. It recommends the widest possible range of measures across all disciplines to tackle this. And it makes a number of eminently sensible recommendations, including a second green revolution. But surprisingly, there are some things that the report does not say. It doesn't state the obvious fact that it would be much easier to feed 8 billion people than 10. Nor does it suggest that the measures to achieve such a number, such as family planning and the education and empowerment of women, should be a central part of any program that aims to secure an adequate food supply for humanity. It doesn't refer to the prescient statement 40 years ago by Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate and father of the first Green Revolution. He produced new strains of high-yielding, short straw disease-resistant wheat, and in doing so saved thousands of people in India, Pakistan, Africa, and Mexico from starvation. But he warned us that all he had done was to give us a breathing space in which to stabilize our numbers. The government's report anticipates that food prices may well rise with oil prices and makes it clear that this will affect poorest people worst and discusses various ways to help them. But it doesn't mention what every mother subsisting on the equivalent of a dollar a day already knows, that her children would be better fed if there were four of them around the table instead of ten. I suspect that you could read a score of reports by bodies concerned with global problems and see that population is clearly one of the drivers that underlies them all, and yet find no reference to this obvious fact in any of them. Why this strange silence? I meet no one who privately disagrees that population growth is a problem. No one 
except flat earthers, can deny that that planet is finite. We can all see it in that beautiful picture from our Earth, of our Earth, taken from the Apollo mission. It remains an obvious and brutal fact that on a finite planet, human populations will quite definitely stop at some point. And that can only happen in one of two ways. It can happen sooner by fewer human births, in a word, by contraception. That's the humane way, the powerful option which allows all of us to deal with the problem if we collectively choose to do so. The alternative is an increased death rate, the way in which all other creatures must suffer through famine or disease or predation. That, translated into human terms, means famine or disease or war over oil or water or food or minerals or grazing rights or just living space. There is, alas, no third alternative of indefinite growth. The sooner we stabilize our numbers, the sooner we stop running up the down escalator. Stop population increase, stop the escalator, and we have some chance of reaching the top, that's to say, a decent life for all. According to the Global Footprint Network, there are already over 100 countries whose combination of numbers and affluence have already pushed them past the sustainable level. They include almost all developed countries. This country is one of the worst. There, the aim should be to reduce over time both the consumption of natural resources per person and the number of people, while, needless to say, using the best technology to help maintain living standards. It's tragic that the only current population policies in developed countries are perversely attempting to increase their birth rate in order to look after the growing number of old people. The notion of ever more old people needing ever more young people who in turn will grow old and need ever more young people and so on ad infinitum is an obvious ecological Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I'm not an economist, nor a sociologist, nor a politician, and it's from their disciplines that answers must come. But I am a naturalist. Being one means that I do know something of the factors that keep populations of different species of animals within bounds, and what happens when they don't. Thanks to our intelligence and our ever-increasing skills and sophisticated technologies, we can avoid such brutalities. We have medicines that prevent our children from dying of disease. We develop ways of growing increasing amounts of food. But we have removed the limiters that keep animal populations in check. But what can each of us do? You or I? Well, there's just one thing I would ask. Break the taboo in private and in public as best you can and as you judge right. Until it's broken here, until it's broken, there is no hope of the action we need. Wherever and whenever we speak of the environment, add a few words to ensure that the population element is not ignored. If you're a member of a relevant NGO, invite them to acknowledge it. If you belong to a church, and especially if you're a Catholic, because its doctrine on contraception is a major factor in this problem, suggest they consider the ethical issues involved. The Hawaiian goose, the oryx, the imperial eagle, which sounded the environmental alarm 50 years ago, were, you might say, the equivalent of canaries in coal mines, warnings of impending and even wider catastrophe. Every one of these global problems, social as well as environmental, becomes more difficult and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more people. <laughs>